Happy Friday, everybody, and welcome to episode 24, 24, I think my voice just squeaked there like I was 13 years old again, of the Snyder Cut. <laughs> the only podcast here at Collider that ventures to go to dangerous places. That's not true. <laughs> I think every podcast we've had has gotten us into some trouble, and this one may get me into some trouble too. Um, I'm going. I'm just going full candid about Sundance. I'm going full candid about the Oscars. This is the voting period, guys. This is when you can make a, make or break opinions. You know, I'm a tastemaker. <laughs> I got to guide people through these thorny decisions. And then, uh, and then I think we're going to end this the uh, episode with a little tribute to. Uh, to Kobe Bryant, um, yeah, just a shocking, terrible loss this week that still has me kind of stunned. Um, all right, let's just start. I don't even know. Let's start with Bambi. Oh, I had that this, this one. I had this one for weeks, guys, and I just didn't look into it. It was in the notes. It's in the notepad. Um, I guess Geneva Robertson Dwart and Lindsay Beer are going to be writing a script for a new Bambi movie for Disney. It's the latest live action film that they're doing. Uh, I always love Bambi. I mean, and I just lost my mom a couple years ago, so I imagine if I rewatched it, like I would just absolutely lose it. Uh, I think is it is it a good one to do? I, I mean, they're they're burning through these so quickly. Like I don't know what I w- what the al- alternative would be. I think that they're going to do it like The Lion King in The Jungle Book, which could be really cool. I mean, I mean, God, okay, you know, Bam- Bambi's an adorable Disney character, uh, and these are two of the the top screenwriters in the business. So, you know, I'm I'm open to it. I didn't love The Lion King, but only because you know I had such strong affinity for that animated movie that they kind of just did re- you know shot for shot. Like I don't think that I have that same you know, sentimentality with, with Bambi, which I probably saw when I was really young and, and maybe once more since, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm down. Um, there's Transformers action, guys. James Vanderbilt and Joby Harold. they are, they've each been hired to write a script. So Paramount's doing dual development on this one. I guess one of them is going to be set with, you know, kind of like, I don't know if it's within the Bumblebee universe or a movie like Bumblebee, and then we'll and then another will sort of uh, try to re- reboot, if you will, or, or start the next chapter of the main franchise. Um, and I don't know, if, I don't know who's doing who, I, which one, you know, like I don't know if that was actually reported, but these are obviously two of the top, uh, you know, two more of the top screenwriters in town. James Vanderbilt wrote Zodiac, so he has my eternal admiration for that one. Uh, I mean, do we need more Transformers? I really like Bumblebee, but I don't know. Like, I feel like, particularly without Michael Bay, and, and I think he has said that he has directed his last Transformers movie, what are these movies really without his insane imagination, right? Priyanka Chopra Jonas signing on to Matrix 4. I thought that was pretty interesting while I was away. Don't know who she's going to be playing. I feel like she fits like the uh, the Monica Bellucci type. Again, I'm not sure what um, what Warner Brothers is planning with this. Like, I'm fascinated as to what it's actually going to be. Uh, I really like this new cast. I mean, I don't know how I don't know if Priyanka Chopra Jonas is a great actress or anything, but she is a an international superstar, no doubt, and it's kind of perfect. I mean, that's what this movie needs. It needs to be a global hit for Warner Brothers, uh, which is also doing Little Shop of Horrors. And Taron Egerton, apparently, reportedly in talks for this one, honestly, I had not been really tracking the male lead as much as I had the female lead, and I'd heard that Scarlett Johansson was sitting on an offer. Uh, she hadn't obviously decided you know, what she wanted to do yet because she wanted to wait until award season was sort of over. Um, you know, I think that Renee Zellweger is the heavy favorite to win the Oscar, but you never know. You know, she already has one. Scarlett hasn't, this is like her first nominations or uh, first nominations. So, uh, you know, I think that they wanted to wait and see just in case there was, you know, something happened on Oscar night before she made any uh, big career decisions. But yeah, I think she has the offer for that. And and, uh, Taryn Edgerton would be a great call for for Seymour. Like, I mean, I don't love it. I would have liked to see him maybe a little bit 
nerdier. Um, you know, like Taron Egerton, there's something cool about him, which is why he's Eggsy in, in the Kingsman movies, you know? But uh, there, listen, it could be worse. It could be worse. And he obviously proved that he has singing chops with Rocket Man, even though uh, you know he didn't get the, the nomination that some thought that he was entitled to. I saw that Uncharted got bumped back to next year. It was supposed to come out this Christmas. There was just no way Sony was going to make that date, uh, particularly if they're trying to film like a, a Spider-Man movie this summer with Tom Holland. So Uncharted uh, is now going to come out I don't know, next March or something? Or April? I forget what it was. I wasn't really paying attention, but I know that I got bumped. Um, what else? What else? Oh, Sony's rebooting Anaconda. Wait, you know, I heard that news and it was like, talking about scraping the bottom of the barrel. I don't think Anaconda was great the first time around with Jennifer Lopez. But it makes sense. It makes sense given Crawl. Um, there's just... You, you can get people to the theater with these kinds of uh, extreme monster movies. And if you keep the budget low, which, you know, Sony's pretty good at, then you can turn in a nice profit. And Sony proved what it can do with Escape Room last year. Uh, and, and another movie that actually we're about to talk about, Don't Breathe. Remember that one? That was a Screen Gems release, I believe. And that did really, really well for the studio. And now there's a, you know, Don't Breathe 2 is moving forward. With the original uh, co-writer, I think it's uh, Rado Sagayas, or Sayagas, uh, I forget. Um, yeah, uh, Say- Sayagas. Uh, he co-wrote the first one, and it's like I feel like just the other day, right before I went to, went to Sundance, I was talking to Collider's Mark Fernandez about how great "Don't Breathe" is. Like Fede Alvarez, I love his I love his stuff. I didn't love you know the Dragon Tattoo movie. Sorry guys, I feel like I'm about to sneeze. Whew. You got to fight those sneezes coming off. I'm on the air, body. Listen to me. Sorry. You know, everybody comes back with the Sundance flu. I'm fighting it off. So, yeah, Fernandez and I were talking about how great uh, Don't Breathe is. It's just so perverted and, like, demented. Like, you see that semen hanging off the baster, and it just, like... I don't know. It go, it conjures some some dark stuff. And so I, I kind of love that someone from the first film is going to shepherd this sequel. It's a great role for Stephen Lang. Like, I'm all for this becoming a franchise, please. Um, a lot of, like, comic book stuff happening, I feel like. that uh, The Batman writer, first of all, the Batman started shooting. Uh, congrats to Matt Reeves. Um, and I think that Peter Sarsgaard was revealed to be playing a DA, but not... Harvey Dent, it was like it had a different name. It was like Gil Corvino or something. I don't even know. Again, I keep saying I don't even know, and that's because uh, I was just at Sundance, guys, and I barely know what day it is. Uh, I, I was sleeping like two hours a night there. Like, it was bad. Um, so I, ba- I barely know my own name. But uh, anyways, right. The Batman started shooting. We don't know if Peter Sarsgaard is actually playing Harvey Dent, although I kind of get that vibe. I feel like there was enough teasing in the days you know, surrounding his announcement. Um, right, Mattson Tomlin. He, he's, do, he's got two deals with, with Rogan and Point Grey. He's doing this mimetic comic book, which is like a horror one, and then there's a sci-fi one, I feel like. Right, called Fear Agent, and Amazon got that one. So, like, you know, Matt and Tomlin in, in in big demand right now. Uh, Rogan and Point Grey really have, I think, they have really good taste as producers. So, there's just so much. But it's like, even if you're not DC or Marvel these days, there's so much comic book stuff going on. Rosario Dawson this week signed on to DMZ, a comic book adaptation over at like HBO Max that uh, Ava DuVernay is going to direct the pilot for. I love Rosario Dawson so. You know, I'm happy for her, but it's like one another con- like this is three comic book movies uh, this week that have nothing to do with like the main ones that you know that you're gonna get stuff. Oh right, Michael Helfant and Bradley Gallo, a couple producers I really like. They did uh, the Halle Berry movie, The Call. They acquired Green Hornet, those rights, and that's another one where it's like ugh, I don't understand like what is the appeal of this all these sort of like 50s 60s 70s heroes like I don't know I guess with Kato you have a unique opportunity 
uh, you know, to enter like the, the, the Asian marketplace. I don't know about right now, considering all the movie theaters are shut down due to the coronavirus, but still, in the future, they will reopen. And I could see something like Green Hornet working overseas, but I don't know necessarily that it will work here. What else? All right, another one. Oscar Isaac. So right before uh, I came to Sundance, start, uh, signed on to star in Brian K. Vaughn's Ex Machina comic book. He already obviously did a movie called Ex Machina, so now that's called The Great Machine. That is yet another comic book thing. Like, it's just there, there's just no uh, ending to it. Um, and speaking of uh, continuations, Megan McDonald, the WandaVision writer, she got hired to write Captain Marvel 2. This was obviously inevitable. Like, you're not going to not make a sequel to a movie that made a billion dollars. And I think Captain Marvel's one of. I don't know, like five Marvel movies that made a billion dollars? I forget. I wish I knew these things. I got I to gotta brush up on my box office before the Schmodown season starts. I'll tell you that. Um, Channing Tatum signing on to Bob the Musical. This is a long gestating Disney project. Tom Cruise once flirted with it. It, it actually sounds like a nice little vehicle for Channing Tatum, who I like. I, I like the character is like someone who uh, starts hearing everybody's inner songs, and I don't know. I I, th- I think that's the kind of mode that I'd like to see Channing Tatum in. He has not really been doing that much lately, and he, there's been a bunch of announcements in the last couple months, and I don't really, I didn't really like any of those. I was waiting quite a while to announce this. Uh, and then they asked me not to because I didn't realize that he had these, these other irons in the fire. So, uh, yeah, we waited a while on this Bob the Musical announcement, but it finally came together. And, Chan- listen, Channing Tatum will benefit from that Disney association. And Yeah, I, like, I, I've always liked Channing Tatum. It's kind of, he needs to get back to the basics. You know, they, and, and I don't know why they can't rev up another Jump Street movie. Like, that should be a, a priority at Sony this year, which has struggled to, you know, relaunch stuff like Men in Black, Charlie's Angels. Like, they should just go back to what works. Uh, big news at Fox, by the way. Emma Watts resigning this week, stepping down. I, I, I just, it must have been a huge reduction for her to go from a, an entire slate of movies to like, I think she was going to be making four movies a year. Uh, and some of that stuff, or maybe it was just four theatrical movies a year. And, and some of that stuff was like for Hulu or, you know, other streaming stuff. I don't know, but it just didn't sound like the gig that she had initially signed up for, and she's going to be fine. Like, and I and I almost caught myself saying she's one of the best female executives in town. She's one of the best executives in town. She's one of the smartest people in this business. So, I, you know, she's going to land on her feet and be just fine, whether she takes another executive job, like a corporate job, or whether she strikes out on her own, like the way Amy Pascal has, really. Um... Also, I think it was, this was during the festival, uh, Obi-Wan announced is going back to the basics. They are bringing in a new writer. The, the episode order, order has been cut from six to four. I, I guess, you know, Lucasfilm just did not, she, Kathy Kennedy did not like, you know, what she was seeing in the scripts. And so all these people who had been working on pre-production, you know, building sets and, you know, whatever it may be, they got shut down because the scripts are going to, you know, go back to square one. I mean, on one hand, you love to see it because you don't want somebody to like mess up Obi Wan Kenobi by rushing something to air. But on the other, it's, it's yet another example of like why can't they get it right the first time? I mean, I guess Star Wars is under such a microscope. Like maybe other places do things that that, that elude the press, whereas nothing can elude the press when it comes to Star Wars. But uh, for the most part, anyways. And, and, like, it took a while to pin the story down because at first there was word that it was canceled and, and you know, my sources were adamant that that wasn't true. Um, and and I think Ewan's people themselves were like, no, like, he's he's still attached to do it. Um, so I, I had a feeling that even though it wasn't canceled, there probably was some turmoil and, and it turned out to be just, like, really the Cassie and Andor series where they just sent everybody home and then they brought in Tony Gilroy and he's going to... You know, do what he's gonna do. So we'll we'll see who does Obi Wan. I wonder if it will be like Lawrence Kasdan or something. Ron Howard signing on to do the Fixer. I think is this another comic book movie? I I barely like read that announcement. Um, 
it sounded like a change of pace though for him I, and I, like I remember thinking that much and Steve has a great interview up with Ron Howard like you know a whole bunch of clips he got a ton of info on like the Willow series that they're planning um, so check that out over on you know Collider Video's YouTube channel Kevin Hart and Jason Statham doing the action comedy The Man from Toronto from uh, the Expendables whatever director Patrick Hughes uh, you know this is Kevin Hart obviously took a bit of a hit with all that's happened in the last year, year and a half. I, I don't, I mean, he's still a gigantic star, don't get me wrong, but I, I don't know if this represents like a step down for him. I, but, you know, Jason just did a movie with Dwayne. I'm sure Dwayne was like, you know, Jason was fine to work with because uh, he's tight with Kevin. Like, I, I I don't know. This just feels like Jason Statham swapping, <laughs> swapping the rock for Kevin Hart. And and you know what? Really, what is the difference there? They they just swap roles. Um, man, Whew. the French Dispatch coming out on July twenty fourth, twenty twenty. That's the new Wes Anderson movie. Hell of a cast. Love that Benicio del Toro was uh, above everybody on it. Um, and I, and I, by the way, the full title was like the French Dispatch of Liberty, Kansas, something. Man, I, I wish I was better prepared for this podcast today. <laughs> you can tell I'm beat. Uh, or we just haven't gotten to the stuff that I really want to talk to. These are just the headlines. I'm, that's what I'm not prepared for. Everything else, I'm ready to like rock and roll. Uh, TV exec Fred Silverman died. He had a huge impact on the medium from All in the Family to Charlie's Angels, Hill Street Blues. He was even the guy responsible for Roots. He put that on the air. So that's a huge loss for the television industry. Uh, I saw that The Crow is back in active development. I mean... Sure. Uh, I don't know that it ever wasn't. I mean, until you have a writer and a director, I don't know how in development you are. Like, you need somebody working on it. Um, either way, the, the the Crow is one of those, you know, projects that will always be kicking around because the rights are valuable. And there is a fan base for this. They just need to, you know, they, go, they can't go make a $100 million movie. I don't even know if they can make a $55 million movie like Joker. I think you have to go make a movie like Dread that's kind of nitty gritty, 15 to 25 million or something like that. I don't even know how much Dread costs, but it couldn't have been much more than, the, than that figure. Um, oh, I saw rumors that CAA had had conversations with Paradigm to buy them. And then Paradigm, Sam Gores was like, absolutely not happening. Like, issued an internal memo to his staff. Uh, you know, just deny the reports. What I just thought was funny is that CA would definitely buy Paradigm just to show UTA it could close a deal that the other couldn't. But I don't, I don't know how likely that is. I do think that if Paradigm was going to, you know, sell and and team up, they would go with a place like UTA to try to topple a place like CA or WME. I don't even know if that would like move the needle necessarily. I mean, it's, Paradigm has a huge music business, but. Uh, yeah, that would that would be interesting. That'd be interesting. Do 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 do. What else we got? Oh God! You see this story about Netflix changing its uh, its metric? It used to be that seventy percent. If you watch seventy percent of a title, that would count as a view. Now it's just two minutes. And the way that they have things. You know, just like five seconds. Like, like I said, I was watching that uh, the Devil Next Door, and they're showing like the graves of all the Jews who, who were killed in the Holocaust. And then within five seconds, it was like a new series that was on, and I was like, "Whoa, hey, uh, yeah." If, if I just let that run for two minutes, that's a view. So it's bullshit. Uh, it goes without saying. I mean, there's no incentive for Netflix to share its metrics with the outside world. I, I'm sure it shares them with like filmmakers and stuff, but until we get filmmakers to go on the record, like, and even then, like, you know, they're just going off what the streamer's telling them. Like, I don't know. I, I just think that we as the media and people who consume this these metrics and care about them, like we have to be very skeptical and wary of them. That's what a journalist's job is, is to question things. And there's nothing more questionable than these goddamn readings. Uh, Jodie Foster signing on to direct, to direct The Day They Stole the Mona Lisa. Sounded like a pretty interesting art heist movie. This is all from, uh, and Chiwetel Ejiofor directing a movie called Barab Peace. These are both projects from the LA Media Fund, uh, funded by Jeffrey Soros, the billionaire. 
Uh, they also have Rick Famuyiwa doing a TV series called Keys to the City. So that was an interesting story. I think the deadline did about uh, LA Media Fund, who also uh, did Summertime. I think they provided the money for that at uh, at Sundance, and that's I did. Two uh, video reviews at Sundance. I think one was for Summertime, the other was for Promising Young Woman. So make sure to check those out. Me and Perry taped them uh, just for you guys. And we're going to talk about Sundance in just a second. I also wanted to talk about uh, the Irresistible trailer. This is the trailer for Jon Stewart's new movie. Didn't care for it. Wasn't. I mean, I was really interested in this in development, too. Just didn't look as funny as I thought it would be. I think Rose Byrne's going to end up stealing this one. I know a little, you know, she's playing a very sexualized character. Um, or someone who, who kind of uses her sexual, sexuality to her advantage. Uh, and, yeah, it just, pff, who, who wants to see this stuff if it's already on TV for free every night? Like, the, the politics. This guy's a Democrat, and they're trying, you know, the campaigns. And, and like, ah, oh, shut up. I don't care. So, not into it. Um, Swallow, I am into. That's from, I think it's Carlo Mirabella Davis. Shit, I hope I'm not fucking that up. Um, but anyways, it looks terrific. Like, it's Haley Bennett. She's getting great reviews. She plays this housewife who wants to exert some control over her life. So, she begins swallowing foreign objects like thumbtacks, marbles, paper clips. There's all kinds of weird shit. It looks super creepy. I can't wait to see it. I feel like it's been doing the festival rounds for like a year, and I always miss it. Um, all right, Sundance. Oh. Sundance was a good time this year. Um, it was a, a you know a lot of work. It's a lot of movies, more movies than I was than I thought I was going to get to see. Uh, also, like, watched six episodes of the new Richard Jewell series, read, like, 250 pages in my Columbine book. I got a lot done. Um, I've done three reviews. I got to work on another, and I may write a fifth, depending on if I get to watch something uh, this weekend before the festival ends. But let's talk about what I saw. Um, the best thing I saw... Uh, phone, guys. Don't you hate when that happens? You still have to check it. So the best thing that I saw was Assassins, and that's the documentary about two women who are sort of duped into assassinating Kim Jong-un's half-brother in an airport in broad daylight. It was incredible, like just the footage that they have from the airport of these girls. It's amazing. Um... So I don't know who's going to buy that. It would kind of be perfect for, for Netflix, although I could see somebody even bigger picking it up. It's that good. I could see it being a theatrical doc. Uh, I would give that one probably an A-, minus, and that was the best thing that I saw. So there was no like you know A-grade movie this year, although I didn't see Nine Days, which Steve came in absolutely raving about. Um, I did see Promising Young Woman. That was a B plus for me. I thought it was really good. Like, what a tremendous uh, debut feature from e Emerald Fennel, uh, who did you know the second season of Killing Eve. Carrie Mulligan is fantastic in this. It, it definitely goes to some places that I wasn't expecting, and that they're not necessarily selling in the trailer. Uh, I love the supporting cast in this: Connie Britton, uh, Alfred Molina, um, Allison Breeze, terrific. Like. This is a pretty interesting movie, and it's very entertaining, and it's not for everyone, but I think if you if you give it a chance, like and I, I think you'll really like Promising Young Woman. Uh, I blew off the D. Rees movie, the last thing he wanted, and it was you know not because I had a feeling it was bad or anything. It actually looked okay. It's got Anne Hathaway and Ben Affleck, Willem Dafoe, like a great cast. However, um, it's coming to Netflix in like three weeks. So I was like, eh, I'm not going to like spend a slot on that movie if I don't have to. And there was a movie playing opposite it called Into the Deep. And holy shit, am I glad that I made this audible at the line, guys. Thanks to Jason Gorber. We should all be following uh, at, on Twitter, filmfest underscore CA. Into the Deep is about like this 
you know, inventor, this independent inventor, Peter Madsen, who was building like rockets and submarines. And he had like a whole crew of like volunteers and they like, you know, were very tight knit and, um, you know, he couldn't afford to pay them uh, or, you know, I don't know what he had arranged with them, but, you know, they did it because they wanted to help him to be a part of history. And so there's this documentary filmmaker, I think it's Emma Sullivan, who's capturing, you know, the launch of this this new submarine, the Nautilus. And what she ends up capturing, like this is about a woman who, who went to go make one movie and wound up making quite another because uh, – just, you know, around the climax of, of this documentary, the submarine goes missing. And uh, Peter's on it with this Swedish journalist, Kim Wall. And he surfaces and he's like, hey, I, I dropped her off. You know, uh, I, I don't know what happened to her after that. You know, the, the, the submarine sunk, but I'm okay. But, you know, that's a suspicious story. The woman's boyfriend said he'd never heard from her. So it turns out, you know, that. He killed her. And I won't get into, like, you know, too, too many spoilers, but, like, the footage that she has of this guy talking about certain things on the very day of the murder, like, hours before it, sort of outlining for her what what could happen, it's astonishing. I mean... And it's a, it, it, like the, the middle drags a little just because it's like t- almost too much with this team of, of people who are and, and like and the submarine just like the day to day on it because obviously that's the majority of the footage uh, and it's unique footage but so the middle dragged just a little but the end made it so worth it it was it was absolutely fantastic check that out that is a Netflix movie and it's perfect for them Netflix also had Lost Girls which was my fourth favorite of the festival that's about the the uh, Gilgo Beach killer, the, the Craigslist killer, who was killing, pro- you know, ordering prostitutes on Craigslist and then killing them, and he's been dumping bodies, you know, uh, on Long Island for 20 years, and and he's still out there. Nobody's ever caught this guy. He could be watching himself in this Netflix movie this weekend at home with surrounded by his family. Like, it's totally fucked up to think about. Um, Amy Ryan is superb like she doesn't get a lot of lead roles she knocks this one out of the park Liz Garbus is her first feature film um and it's you know really really good I think I heard somebody call it tedious and it's not it's not tedious uh it's just not about it's not about like the thrilling stuff when you think about like a serial killer investigation it's more it's not about the killer it's more about the victims it's a lot like the Netflix series Unbelievable in that sense and I think if you like Unbelievable you'll really like this the performances are great across the board Thomas and McKenzie uh, Miriam Shore Lola Kirk uh, Gabriel Byrne yeah like Kevin Corgan everybody's really good so uh, I hope you'll check out Lost Girls I think when it debuts it's either late February or early March I think it's maybe early March. Uh, the Ren and Stimpy documentary, Happy, Happy, Joy, Joy. That was really good. I uh, watched a link of that one. And it, even though it waits like way too long to get into like the stuff, of, uh, uh, you know, the allegations surrounding John Kay, who had a relationship with a girl who was 16 years old uh, and more than one relationship, you know, it, it, it does wait too long to address this stuff. But when it does, it doesn't shy away. And I understand that John Kay probably wouldn't have participated if if it was all about that. Um, and I think that his participation is essential to to telling the story, not just of like you know what happened with him in his personal life, but like to this TV show that you know was beloved by millions around the world. Um, and now, you know, as one of its own like artist says, like it's just tainted, like it's you know nobody wants to touch this thing, um, no one wants to be associated with it. Uh, I loved Ryan and Stimpy growing up and how gross it was like and 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 it is from like a singular mind in a way that you know some of the best cartoons are but yeah watching this stuff like you know that it's wrong and he knows that it's wrong and the only person who doesn't know it's wrong is is the girl you know because she's young and, and, and naive you know like and and it's not on her to know it's wrong, it's on it's on him. He's the adult, and and yeah, he he, he fucks up in a bad way, and uh, yeah, it's 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 tough to watch. Um, it's tough to hear you know this, this woman like look back on her teenage years and and recount them, and 
you know, the hold that he sort of had over her, her as, as a, you know, a person of power who, who she looked up to. So that was excellent. Uh, the Climb. Uh, that's all right. There's a trailer out for that Sony Classics release. That's um, two guys biking, and one of them's getting married. And he's like, "Oh, I'm so excited to get married." And the other buddy's like, "Listen, man, I, I slept with her." And it, it like it, it was just it was really funny. I really like the chemistry between these two guys. Uh, I like the female lead, Gail Rankin from Glow. Like Todd Barry's in it. You're always gonna win me over if you cast Tom Todd Barry. That's just a little uh, word to the wise. So the climb, I, you know, I wasn't surprised that Sony Classics grabbed it because it, it could be not like a movie that takes like a low budget comedy like Clerks that takes off, but you could see them like getting something bigger from this, like whether it's Mc, Danny McBride and those guys giving them like a job on a Rough House production or even set like Seth Rogen. Um, but yeah, those guys are very, very funny. Michael Cavino and Kyle Marvin. Um, Justin Simeon's Bad Hair was the first movie that I saw at the festival. It was good. It went on way too long. It's like 20 minutes too long. And, you know, it started to lose me towards the end. That was a problem with a lot of movies uh, this year, a lot of midnight movies especially. They just didn't quite stick the landing. Um, but but Bad Hair was a very enjoyable watch, very well acted. Uh, Elle Lorraine is a tr- you know terrific newcomer, and it's about you know a, a woman who gets a weave and and the the weave has a mind of its own and and a nose for blood. You know, very original, obviously inspired by like K horror, J horror, that kind of stuff. Um, but it worked. It worked. It was very effective. I also like the force majeure inspired uh, film Downhill, which you know isn't quite or just a remake of force majeure, but because uh, it is a little bit different. But obviously, you know the general premise is is very much the same. Julie Louis Dreyfus is terrific in this. She's um, you know that's my first real awards prediction of the year is that she will get a Golden Globe nomination for best actress in a comedy musical for this film. You know if if. She campaigns for it, but you know she's obviously one of the most decorated television actresses of all time. Her peers love her. I, I think she has several moments in this film that she really gets to shine. I don't know if she got one of these a Golden Globe nod for enough set. I have to go back and look at that. But um, she she was really good in this. You know, Will Ferrell is a little is a little miscast. As, you know, as as her husband. I don't know who else I would have put in this film. Um. But but she definitely gets like you know the better part I would say. I also saw the Night House, David Bruckner's new horror movie starring Rebecca Hall. This you know may have been like the best performance that I saw at the festival. Like Rebecca Hall was great in this movie as like this grieving widow who finds that her house is haunted after her husband uh, kills himself basically. But as this sort of mystery unfolded, it kind of felt a little bit more convoluted to me. Um, I don't know. I felt, I felt like there were some plot holes I either didn't understand or, you know, that just weren't addressed. Um, so while I thought it was good, I liked it. And there's like some real scares here. Like, you know, the imagery is great. The, the sound, like there's this one song, The Calvary Cross. Um I think it's like by Richard and Linda Thompson. It's terrific, like, and that provided the theme for the film. It, like, there's a lot to like here, but I don't know that it fully came together for me. Searchlight ponied up twelve million dollars for it uh, for worldwide. I don't know if this is really a theatrical release, um, particularly given Rebecca Hall's like track record at the box office. Like, I don't. I'm not here to be like mean or anything. I just don't know that she's like a movie star who puts butts in seats. Um, she can carry a movie like she does this one, but you know, when when you look at her box office track record, you know, the films that she has led on her own, they've all obviously been very small indies, and and none has none have really taken off. Um, so you know, I, I'm rooting for everybody. I, I I like Luke and Ben, the writers, and David and Rebecca, again, Rebecca. Like, congrats to everybody on the sale. Uh, I just don't know if this is like the kind of wide release uh, or even like, you know, a limited release that, that Searchlight typically handles. It felt like something that would creep you out watching at home on Netflix. But, you know, I don't know what Netflix came to the table with. Uh, Summertime, that was a movie from Carlos Lopez Estrada, whose blind debut, Blind Spotting, I did not really care for. 
this was better somehow. Uh, I, you know, the first few minutes, as I said in the video review with Perry, I really didn't care for it. I was like, oh, this is not for me. I kind of wanted to just bail. I was like, I'm going to hate this. But it did win me over by the end. Like, the characters just grew on me. I settled into the format. And, you know, I could see Summertime catching on. Like, that was one of the best interviews that I did at Sundance was, like, getting to talk to these kids. Um, you know, a lot of whom were under underprivileged kids who who – for whom like poetry kind of saved their lives, gave them a second family, helped them express themselves. So I really valued what that movie was doing. Uh, I saw Spree. I think I gave that a B minus. That's the Joe Keery movie where he plays a rideshare driver killing people for the amusement of his audience. This is another movie that didn't quite stick the landing necessarily. Uh, its message was a little muddled, but I had fun getting there. And Zola was another movie like that Although I thought Spree was ultimately better than Zola. And guys, like, you know, just because I'm a white guy who didn't love Zola, I was just shocked to see some certain things like floating around online. Like, that, that, that I just don't think it's, it's, if that's how you feel, that's how you feel. I don't really think it's acceptable. Um, I understand that there are certain ways of looking at this movie. That maybe I didn't, that, you know, that I didn't think about, but the, you know, you could say that about every movie that, that there's a way of thinking about it that a certain critic missed or whatever. Um, and I just think that ultimately, the movie felt like empty calories, and I know I wasn't alone on that. I talked to a lot of people about Zola at Sundance, and listen, some people loved it, some like loved what Janisa was going for. You know, it felt like a sort of, you know, wannabe Harmony Corinne movie. And it may very well get an NC-17. It's pretty, you know, there's definitely some extreme moments in this. The performances were all good. I didn't really have any problem with any of the performances. Coleman Domingo is is kind of ferocious. Um, Riley Keough is very, it's a very committed performance from her. Taylor Page is good as Zola. I really like Nick Braun. <laughs> but... And, and there's a lot of style to spare. I just don't know how much substance was ultimately there. Uh, yeah, I think it loses track of its main character a little bit. Um, I saw the new St. Vincent movie, the, the the Nowhere In. I have to write a review of that today, so I think I'm going to hold off on, on my thoughts. Um, it was okay, though. I'll give you that much. It was okay. She was she was better than I thought she would be, St. Vincent. I liked her Annie Clark, and, and Carrie Brown scene was good. Uh, the Nest, Sean Durkin's film, this was like, you know, very well acted, like impeccably acted, uh, very well staged, but tough, tough movie to watch. Like this is like Blue Valentine, except not as maybe artful. Um, it just kind of makes you uncomfortable and angry. Like I don't know who this is movie's for, like who's supposed to watch this and have a good time. Um, I don't know. It was just kind of depressing. Um, and, and, and listen, it came at a point in the festival where I was very tired, I, tired. I'll be honest. I did fall asleep for about 20 minutes. I, I, I missed about 20 minutes of this film, but I, I was told with confidence that I didn't miss much. Uh, again, though, Jude Law, Kerry Coon, terrific, it, but it, it is like a play. Uh, the next film was Run, Sweetheart, Run, which I wrote a r really brutal review about. I've been thinking about that review a lot, and unfortunately, I have to stand by it. I just did not like this movie at all. It started out so promising. Um, yeah, it goes off the deep end. I don't really know. This is like the second head scratcher in a row from Blumhouse after Black Christmas, and both are like examples of feminist horror. And while I think it's you know noble, and obviously Jason has taken a lot of flack. Uh, for not hiring female directors, um, and it just so happens that that these two movies were directed by women. Like, it's a complete coincidence. I don't think they're be these are bad movies because they were made by women. That's ridiculous. But I think that they're both pretty bad movies. Um, Black Christmas, Black, uh, yeah. That I mean, that was like, what is going on? Um, and same with this movie, like. It's it, it, it again. It like reminded me of Mandy. Like, and, and some people love Mandy, but I couldn't get on board when Mandy went supernatural and calling in like demon bikers, and I couldn't really get on board with that turn here. 
So, you know, spoiler warning, you know, you, actually, you guys can just go read the review if you want, but, um, yeah, like, Ella Belinska from Charlie's Angels, she stars, she's on her period the entire movie, I mean, it's really set over the course of a night, and I know what you're thinking, like, why is this guy talking about a woman's period, it's inappropriate, but, like, really, it's part of the story, it's a huge part of the story, her period deserves third billing, I just thought it was like preposterous, particularly given the circumstances of the film and who she's up against. And uh, yeah, I, I just think that this movie would be so much, uh, so much better if it went in a different direction. And while I, I love, I love the first ten minutes, and like there's this great static shot. I wish that the title had hit you right in that static shot. Run, sweetheart, run. Door opens, boom, she's out running. Uh, but needless to say, it was not the worst movie that I saw at Sundance. That honor goes to Scare Me, which felt like two hours of bad improv. It's the movie with Aya Cash from You're the Worst. Uh, I think I watched a couple episodes of You're the Worst and couldn't stand it. Um, yeah, I just felt like it was two characters mugging for the camera. They're telling scary stories for two hours, and like you know, slowly this guy begins to realize that 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 this uh, woman is a much better storyteller than than he is. And then Chris Red shows up with a pizza, and it's just it's so dopey. It I'm not surprised it went to shutter. Let's just say that. Um, yeah, that got an F, an F for me, and I only stayed to watch it because. I wanted to be able to talk about it because like I learned that lesson. Like if you're going to walk out on a movie, that's fine. Just you don't get to say anything. So I stayed and now I get to say this movie was fucking horrible. Um, Oscar stuff, man. Uh, so what? Sam Mendes won the DGA. Uh, what else happened? I mean, you all saw it on FYC. I just don't understand like where the narrative came that, that it's Parasite versus 1917. Like, who decides these things? Um, like, are we really just counting out the Tarantino movie? Like, a few weeks ago, we were all like, oh, Tarantino has this in the bag. And now, like, I just, I don't get it. I don't understand... It's tough for me to see, and, and I know this is a horrible ger generality, it's tough for me to see women voting for 1917. And I know that these are their their sons, their brothers, their fathers, um, but, uh, you know, there are just other movies that I feel like speak to, to the Academy's female membership, which, you know, really should not be underestimated. Uh, Parasite, I just don't know that they're ready to give a foreign language movie the best picture Oscar, when it's already going to get a picture Oscar, essentially. And it could very well win a directing award as well, or a screenplay award. You know, like, who knows? It, like, it could win other awards. Production design. I, I just don't... I, I can't, it's hard for me to envision that scenario. Um, which is why I think something crazy is going to happen. And... You know, like, I know that uh, 1970 won the PGA, the DGA, but, like, Spotlight lost those, and, and it won. I know that Spotlight also had won the WGA and the SAG Ensemble Award, but I'm, I'm just saying, like, all these precursors, you know, like, they don't really mean anything. They don't. And, and I think that there's just so much stock being put in this stuff. The people who write about Oscars these days don't understand what the Oscars are. And, like, David Poland, I thought, had a really interesting column, you know, like, about what they are and what they're not. They're not about, uh, and, and, you know, may, maybe it wasn't even Poland, too. I, I've been reading a lot of stuff lately, even some stuff on Facebook. And the Oscars are not about honoring the best movies of the year. They're about people honoring their favorites at a certain point in time, you know, due to all kinds of different factors, whether it's the political circumstances of the time or a marketing campaign or, you know, their best friend was the, was the key grip. Like, I'm, I'm just saying, like, it takes years, maybe even a decade, to just, to really look back and, and see what was the best film of any given year. And people don't seem to understand that. 
And there's a lot of people writing about the the Oscars who don't even don't understand what they are. And that's where the frustration com- comes in because it, it, I mean, all these Oscar experts, w- what are they doing? They're just looking at the winners and and saying, well, this plus this equals this. Like there's no there's not much insight to it. Uh, and I don't think that a lot of these people have any relationships with any academy members whatsoever. Um, I can tell, I mean, I'm probably Facebook friends with a thousand Academy members. Okay. Even if it's not a thousand, even if, even if that's an exaggeration, it's pretty comfortable being like three to 500 and you can just see over the course of the year, like what movies they're responding to. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm just saying, listen, if I, if I was making a bet, and I was filling out a prediction chart and trying to be like get a hundred percent. I would say nineteen seventeen, but something is just telling me something funky is going to happen, and it's frustrating that no one is sort of giving that theory any sort of credit. Um. Anyways, man, are we, is that is that like it? Is that I guess just Kobe time. Well. The Kobe should fuck me up, guys. I was sitting at the Mustang in Park City where we were doing all of our interviews. Hold on. I was sitting there, and Dorian shows me his phone in the middle of an interview. I think Steve was interviewing somebody. And it's a TMZ report, and it says that Kobe Bryant died in a helicopter crash. And, I mean, I couldn't believe it. It knocked the wind out of me. And, obviously, I wanted to, like, talk about it with somebody. And, um, you know, for that first, like, 10, 15 minutes, you're just, like, on Twitter. You're, like, you know, just I definitely was reckless with the with the retweet button. And and at one point there were like, or I don't know if it was one of my high school buddies or if I saw it on Twitter, but there were rumblings that Rick Fox may have, may have been on board. He was obviously close with Kobe. Rick Fox is a former Celtic. I'm a huge Celtics fan. Um, I mean, I just I I still can't believe it. All these days later, uh, and all to like get to a basketball game you know like a basketball practice or whatever like on on time um it's 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 a horrible a horrible tragedy uh and then so i think i went and did the interview with the team from sergio including wagner mora and the director of that film had spent some time making you know he's he's a documentary filmmaker i think he'd spent some time in the military and he was like listen you just got to like you know, forget about it and, and move on and do your job. Like, cause that's what they teach you in the military. Like there's no time to dwell on like, Oh, your, your friend just got shot next to you. Like y- obviously you want to be there for him, hold his hand, try to get him out of there, whatever it is. But like, they, you know, they, 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 you have to move on. Um, and so, you know, he gave me a little pat on the back and, and I was able to get through the interview. But after that I was fucking broken up and I had my biggest interview coming up, which was the team from lost girls. Uh, which, you know, I ever I read seven years ago and have been tweeting about for seven years. If you if you search at the Insider and Lost Girls, you'll see you know a dozen tweets or so about it. Um, so I was really excited to you know meet Liz Garbus and Amy Ryan and all these people, and you know I felt like tears streaming down my cheeks. And I think that's when we had found out by that point that uh, Kobe's daughter was on the plane uh, or on the helicopter. And it really just goes to show you, like, how precious life is. Like, eh. this guy had an entire life left to live, another 40 years, 50 years, and he was going to have such an impressive second chapter, like, you know, working in entertainment. Obviously, he'd already won an Oscar for animation. Like, he was a a, a guy who understood storytelling. Um you know, one of the rare athletes, I would say, and uh, and yeah, it was just like crazy to see him see that life cut short, um, and it made me, th- you know, 
think just like obviously I was at Sundance. The only time I've been in a helicopter was from Salt Lake City to Sundance when uh, Blade launched the helicopter Uber service and they were giving rides to uh, to people in parks, uh, you know, to, to, to journalists to promote the service. Um, and it was like one of the most incredible things in my life. But yeah, it would have been so easy for something to have gone wrong. And it's not like a plane where you can try to like brace for impact or, you know, make a crash landing. Like, uh, you know, obviously a lot of planes that crash there are no survivors and you know sometimes there are but with helicopter it's it's like it to me it's like almost like being on a motorcycle on the road like just i don't know that i'd ever get on a helicopter again after this i know it's like a freak circumstance and you can't live your life like that but uh i don't know this would give me real second thoughts and i mean you know i don't i don't want to get like too morbid here but like from what I understand of it, like a helicopter crash, like they were probably had passed out before they even hit the ground. Um, if they were like in free fall or being jostled around, you know, the cabin. Um, and I'm just glad that, that that little girl had her father with her to, to tell her that he loved her, uh, in their final moments. Um, and, uh, and yeah, my heart goes out to his, wife Vanessa and the daughters he left behind and obviously everyone else who lost their lives on on board and, and their friends and family like that that's the other tough thing it's got to be so tough to be have been part of this tragedy and all the headlines are about Kobe and his daughter and the world is mourning them and no and, and you're sort of relegated to you know the others seven others killed um you know like it's like a lost or something like uh yeah, it, it just made you want to like call your loved ones um, or hold them tight or whatever because it was it's horrible. It's it's really unimaginable that 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 that's how this guy's life ended after we watched him from the time he was sixteen, seventeen years old. I mean, he came to the NBA right out of high school, uh, and like. Yeah, my brother looked up to Kobe. Like, I mean, we were, you know, I'm a Celtics fan. We hate the Lakers. We hate Kobe. <laughs> but like Derek Jeter, uh, Derek Jeter, um, you know, we, we respected him because he was a, a, a real competitor and a leader. And uh, yeah, my brother had a Lakers jersey, loved, you know, Kobe. Um, yeah, it's just it's just crazy. The whole situation's crazy. And so Steve was in the middle of an interview and I was telling Perry, I was like giving her the signal, like, get, you know, Steve has to wrap up. Like, let's go. And sure enough, as soon as, soon as Steve was done, I I told him, um, and because he had seen some, obviously, you know, seen some commotion uh, during his interview and he was stunned too. And, you know, and then, you know, I, I have to give Steve credit. Um, he made a good editorial decision because I, I think that there had been some some t- some chatter in the slack that you know we should not write about this that this wasn't really for us. He was a sports figure, but he was also an Oscar winner, and it's not about like the traffic. Like it's not about that. It's that this guy deserved you know to be to have his accomplishments written about. Um, and it's just the, the irresponsible journalistic thing to do. Uh, and so Steve just, you know, said, no, 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 we should write an obituary, um, essentially. Uh, and, um, and, you know, that's other stuff that I wanted to talk about. Like, you know, the TMZ stuff, like Scott, I think it was Scott Feinberg at the Hollywood Reporter, who I, I really like, have a lot of respect for Scott, who said the TMZ was like a garbage website. And I think he got like half a half a million likes or something like a figure I could I could never even dream of reaching. Um, and, and and I understand why he got those likes, you know, why people are like that's just disgusting. But first of all, I don't think that that happened. I think that uh, Vanessa Bryant had been notified by the time that the TMZ report hit um, or that they had believed that she had been notified, you know, because that's another thing. Like, it's not like it's not like you can know. Um, 
it's not like you can check that. Like you either believe that she has or, or you know, either way. And, and and if she did find out about it from from TMZ, it's horrible. But I need, but like you guys have to understand, please. I know how you know gruesome this is. TMZ's responsibility is not to Vanessa Bryant. TMZ's responsibility is to the public, and and they're a news operation. And I know some of you think of them as paparazzi, as tabloids, and in many respects they are. But when it comes to celebrity deaths, and, and it's not that I know this firsthand, but I would say I know it secondhand. Like they're just very, very accurate with that stuff. And um, you know they have they have a staffer who I've heard is referred to as the angel of death, who actually gets those calls before everybody from EMTs, coroners, medical examiners, law enforcement, whatever it is. Um, and it's just like I think that I think a TMZ said that it had waited an hour to to report it. Um, TMZ. Its only responsibility really is the truth. Um, and I think that they were very responsible for the most part with their reporting. And it's just like, well, what if you call Vanessa and she doesn't answer? You know, um, you know, are you supposed to wait for her, to wait to get a hold of her? And like, how long are you waiting? And you know that anyone else could, could you know, break this news at any point and they could get it wrong and you have it right. So... You know, again, while I respect Scott Feinberg and, and his point of view, and and you know all the people who who agreed with him by liking it, there's no question in my mind as a journalist that TMZ did the right thing in reporting what it did when it did. Um, meanwhile, you've got that other case across the country at the Washington Post, where the reporter simply tweeted a link to uh, you know the, a story about Kobe's rape trial. Um, or I don't know if it ever went to trial uh, because he had settled, but you know uh, the allegations, nonetheless, uh, a story about them. Didn't put any commentary on it. She was getting death threats. Uh, Marty Baron, who's you know a figure who's depicted in Spotlight, um, you know one of the most respected editors in all of journalism. He was like, "You're making the company look bad, and and you're you know making your colleagues like look bad, and and you need to delete that and." Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, again, I, I certainly didn't think it was maybe the appropriate time for it. Um, but if, like, those women are, are completely entitled. Uh, I think this woman had all, this reporter at the Post had also been a victim of, se- of sexual assault herself. Um, they're completely entitled if that's how they remember Kobe Bryant. If they don't remember him as you know a, gr- a great basketball player, and they see him as the guy who who had a you know horrible you know night in Colorado, and that's how they choose to judge him and define him as like that's not on someone to like that's not on the post to argue. Like it's a fact. It's a fact. Um, it's not really an opinion. Uh, and he was wrong to suspend this woman who has every right to not even speak. She didn't even speak her mind. She just shared someone else's, you know, perspective. And the whole social media policy thing, where she tweeted outside of her beat, her, you know, her her area of of coverage. Like, give me a fucking break. And I thought uh, Charlie Warzel wrote a great great article about how publications expect you. To step out of line, to have you know opinions and all kinds of things, to have an active social media presence, you don't get to have social media followers just playing it safe, and uh, and and putting out like links to stories. You have to have some engagement, some back and forth. That means some people are going to be happy and some people aren't. And uh, I don't know. It's just um, I, I I had her back big time, and I felt like yeah that like that Charlie Warzel thing uh really brought to mind all the mashable stuff that that had happened to me which was again just an example of a a a publication that hadn't really been in the crosshairs before didn't know what to do and just cowered to pressure and like geez like this woman got suspended um uh at first a, a paid suspension at first like you know i just got fired at mashable like it's just and they are very similar things um 
what else happened this week? Oh, yeah. God. And uh, do you guys see the, the news about the Palm Springs sale? That was one thing I wanted to talk about with Sundance, how it went to for $17.5 million and 69 cents, supposedly breaking the record of Birth of a Nation, which uh, sold for 175 But here's the thing. It didn't. Like, I don't understand this. And I don't understand why journalists just, like, copy-paste what they get from a press release rather than apply some critical thinking of their own. If this is a neon Hulu deal, then that's a theatrical streaming deal. And, and you know, Birth of a Nation, I believe, was theatrical only. So unless the streaming rights to an Andy Samberg movie are worth 69 cents, it didn't really break a record. I think that, that those rights were factored into the price. And listen, it's fine if you still want to call it a record because that's, that's what the deal is for. But to me, it's not like box office where, like, well, this movie made three billion dollars. It's the new record holder. Okay, but like, well, Gone with the Wind or whatever, Sound of Music, you know, back in the day, that those admissions would have been four billion. Like, I get that that's not the same thing. Um, I just, I don't know. It felt, it felt weird. Like they didn't want Nate Parker to be the king of Sundance anymore. Um, yeah. But no, nobody asked. Like I just didn't see any journalists even bring that up, and that's what's disheartening to me, is that you'd rather the industry would rather have a bunch of mindless autom- autom- automatons than someone who just thinks on their own. And like I see it in the hiring stuff. Like you know, there there are jobs at LA Times and Vice and Vanity Fair, and and they don't seem particularly interested in hiring the best. You know, like I'm, the the best people, whether it's showbiz, or, you know, almost in anything, they're a little prickly. Uh, so I, I just see the entire energy, entertainment journalism sort of field. It's it's it ain't what it used to be, guys. It ain't what it used to be. Uh, and actually, we lost a big one uh, this week. You know, thankfully he's still around, he's still alive. But Stephen Galloway stepping down uh, at the Hollywood Reporter as executive editor over there to go be the dean of film at, at Chapman. I mean, it's a huge opportunity for him. Um, so, so I totally get why he's sort of uh, leaving journalism behind for now. Um, but you know, it's it's also like a sign of the times. Like I, I just don't think. It, it is what it once was, this field. Um, and that's not to like, that's not a blanket statement. Like, do you see this guy, Daniel Alter, try to get into it with me at Sundance? I, by the way, I got to wrap up the show, but like, he's just, yeah, and I like Daniel. I, I, I would have written a story about him if he'd asked. I would have bought him a drink if I saw him at the festival. But he was just going off for weeks and months about how journalists are scumbags. And like, I, I don't think it. Like I, I even understand what he was like going for, but like, he was he just like was crossing a certain line, and and I could have just unfollowed him quietly and probably should have, you know. So that's my bad, that's my mistake. But I made a show out of it, and well, I, I, and again I said he's a lot like me. I'm not for everybody on Twitter. I think I'm a totally different person in person, um, you know. And some people. You know, like Bibiani. Like I, I like Bibiani when I see him at the Schmodown. Do do I need him following me on Twitter and and you know butting into every little thing I say? No. <laughs> so you know, he just doesn't need to. We don't need to follow each other there, but we can be totally cordial in person when we see each other. And that's how I felt with Daniel. But he obviously you know went off, uh, and so yeah, that uh, that was just a, a sad little back and forth in the middle of the festival. Um. What else happened on Twitter this week? Anything interesting? Should I wrap this shit up? Yeah. I think I think we're out of time. But you know what, guys? Thank you uh for for watching, I guess. Not just listening anymore. You can watch. We are up on Collider Video. We got a couple more episodes of FYC left. I'm excited. I don't know if I'm gonna change my mind on something. Cause I have seen a couple reports where like JoJo, they're subtly insinuating that, that there could be a JoJo uprising, and I do like this new cam- uh, campaign where they've been, uh, you know, doing the the peace fingers. They just waited a little too long, maybe, to institute it. Um, it's going to be interesting. What else do I have brewing? 
Right, Richard Jewell. Oh my God, guys! I, I hopefully I'm going to ask for an interview with Arliss Howard. I don't normally, you know, tell people the interviews I'm asking for before I actually get them, but I'm going to go after Arliss Howard, who I absolutely adore. He's great on this show, uh, the Richard Jewell series. Um, and I think I don't know how much I can say about that. But what I will say is that if you thought that that, that there was real Kathy Scruggs controversy about this uh, the Clint Eastwood movie with Olivia Wilde, holy shit, you guys haven't seen anything. This series, I mean, not that many people are really going to get a chance to see it because it's a Spectrum original, but uh, yeah, it's going to be a conversation starter even more than the Eastwood movie. For sure. Wow. Um, anyways, thank you. For listening to the Snyder Cut, etc. I am at the Insider on Twitter, Instagram, Cameo, buy a Cameo, ask me a question uh, maybe that I didn't get to address here on the show, and uh, and I'll try to get to it privately just for you. Uh, have a great weekend, guys, and welcome back to Justin Kroll, back from paternity leave, ready to do battle, see you out there on the field. Go Niners! Bye.